It's a joy and a privilege for me to be here today with you, and I'm grateful to the Lord for this opportunity. And I would like to welcome all of you to our study today, but first and foremost, let us all welcome our Lord Jesus Christ as our teacher during the time we will spend here together. Our topic today is Christ is all for my family. And if we look at this title, we can identify three elements. It's that we have Christ, then my family, that means my person, myself, and then the families. And we are going to consider a little bit about the connection between, between these three elements, Christ and myself on the one hand, and on the other hand, me and my family. And then to close this circle, we will see how one relationship impacts the other one. Actually, in life, we are looking for some experience that could make us happy, some experience that uh, will make us feel well, will make us feel content. And this is not just the case of Christian, but every person living in this world uh, is confronted with the same question. Who will show us any good? We actually live in a time of advertising and commercials, and everybody is trying to persuade us to buy this stuff and that one in order to be happy, to feel good. And some people are kind of deceived by some of these techniques, so they keep buying, they keep doing things, hoping that one day they will find happiness as a result of that. But unfortunately, there are so many people looking for that experience, and there are so few who really find it. So the question is still here, who will show us any good? And if we think of experiencing some good thing, of finding some profit in life, we need to consider that we do not want to be happy for an hour, for a day, for a week, or for the honeymoon, but we would like an enduring happiness, and this has something to do with eternity. That is why Jesus asks, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but loses his own soul? So if we consider being happy, it would be good to consider being happy for eternity. And there is no happy eternity without Christ. Jesus said that he that gathers not with me scatters abroad. There are many people trying to gain life, and they will eventually end up losing it because they try to gain life without Christ. And this is what we need to realize, that in order to gain life, in order to be able to make sense of it, to find the meaning of it, and to live a meaningful life, we need Him, not just as part of it, but we need Him to be as the title of our topic is, Him to be our all in all. Uh, therefore, He gave us a counsel saying that if we want to achieve things in life, the only way to do so is to maintain a living connection with Him. And He said, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. 
Actually, most of us, we all have good intentions in our lives, in society, in family. We, we all want things to run smoothly. But experience shows that the will is not enough. Besides the will, we need the power to do so. And we remember the Apostle Paul, in one stage of his experience, he had the will to do good, but the power was lacking, was missing. So it took him a while till he realized the right way of doing it. It took him a while till he could say, okay, now I got it. I know how it works. And Jesus states clearly, without me, ye can do nothing. Uh, we can do nothing in any domain of life, in our profession, in our social lives, in our private lives, and in our family lives. Some people might say, oh, well, but look, uh, there are so many great achievements in this world. Some people build skyscrapers, not necessarily with Christ, so they could do something. When Jesus says, without me you can do nothing, he means nothing lasting for eternity. And if we want to do meaningful things, things that should last forever, for that purpose we need him. We need to abide in him and we need him abiding in us. And then our experience will no longer be this kind of try and fail experience, but we will have this glorious, successful experience which the Apostle Paul reached when he realized how things really work. So he ended up saying, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And actually, it is only the presence of Christ that can make men and women happy. This is what we should try to keep in mind. We should try to remember all the time. There is no happiness without Christ. No matter what you try, no matter what your means are, no matter what you can afford, finally you will end up coming to the same conclusion. Happiness or unhappiness depends on the presence or on the absence of Christ in our lives. The presence of Christ alone can make men and women happy. And a happy man and a happy woman put together, they will form, they are very likely to form a happy family because they have this common denominator, which is Jesus Christ. Even though they might differ in some other aspects of life, in some other particulars, at least, they have Christ and sharing this experience of having Christ as your personal savior and close friend will make them happy and bringing two such people together will even boost their happiness to reach a climax for eternity. When Christ is in the heart, he is brought into the family. So we cannot just have Christ in our hearts without this experience impacting our family life. When he is in the heart, he is brought into the family.
and that will be felt in the quality of our relationship. And this experience of togetherness, of a genuine intimacy in all domains uh, of your relationship, which, of course, leads to this feeling of fulfillment and happiness. Love is of God. The unconverted heart cannot originate nor produce this plant of heavenly origin, which lives and flourishes only where Christ reigns. Now, there's this saying in the world that actually all you need is love. But genuine love is of God. This quotation says so nicely, it's a plant of heavenly origin, which we ourselves cannot produce. Many people think they are in love. They imagine they are in love. But what they understand uh, under love is not actually what the real, genuine love is. And it is actually only this kind of love which can make a family be fulfilled in their relationship and can lead to lasting harmony. We can have the best intentions, but our unconverted heart cannot originate or produce it because we are selfish by our nature. We have been born with this tendency towards selfishness. And it is selfishness which destroys relationships. Therefore, the quality of our family life depends on the quality of our relationship with Christ. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, unselfish love. No Christ, no love. No matter how much we want it, no matter how much we desire this experience, we cannot generate it because it's not from this earth. It's a plant of heavenly origin. And this quotation says that it's very exclusive. Only where Christ reigns can there be deep, true, unselfish love. And only this kind of deep, true, unselfish love can make a relation be lasting. Human love can never bear its precious fruit until it is united with a divine nature and trained to grow heavenward. Jesus wants to see happy marriages, happy firesides, and we all want the same thing. But human love is not able to do it. It is helpless when it comes to self-denial, to self-sacrifice. And only when this human love is united with a divine nature and trained to grow heavenward, then we will get the genuine fruit of it. And it is the desire of Jesus that we should be happy, not only in our relationship with him, but also in our relationship with one another, and especially in our family relationships. He wants to see happy marriages, happy firesides, but the testimony says that this is actually a rare thing. Is it, it is actually the exception to the rule because it says that marriage in the majority of cases is a most galling yoke, in the majority of cases. But it is your chance and my chance to be the happy exception, to have a happy marriage to have, to experience this feeling of togetherness around the family fireside. 
the grace of Christ and this alone can make this institution what God designed it should be. You know, sometimes people have problems in their marriage life and they notice that something doesn't work properly. So what they, do they do? They start asking friends, some start reading books on family life, some people even go to some marriage counseling office, and which is not bad by the way, but that will not solve anything if we stick just to that. Because we need something additional to it. We need something supernatural. We need godly solution to human problems. And it is the grace of, the grace of Christ and this alone which can make this institution what God designed that it should be. Christianity, practical Christianity, is the result of our being in love with Christ. And our being in love with Christ will change our perspective upon our relationship with one another. It will make us have a different understanding and as a consequence of that, a different reaction to the many challenges of daily life. So Christianity ought to have a controlling influence upon the marriage relation. We will no longer lose our patience. We will no longer lose our temper because there's some influence in control which acts like a kind of filter. And when some emotions come up, this controlling influence will allow some to go and will restrain some others. There cannot be a happy marriage relationship without Christ. And not just without professing to believe in the existence of God and in the fact that Jesus Christ, His Son, came and died for human beings, but we need to have this practical experience of making Jesus our own personal Savior. And when we behold this love, that will have a controlling influence upon our relation. When the Spirit of God reigns, there will be no talk of unsuitability in the marriage relation. You know, many people say, oh man, I blew it. I thought I was right, but I married the wrong person. Actually, there is a book, which, the title of which is, Everybody Marries the Wrong Person, which is a fact. You do not have 100% compatibility when you get married. But where the Spirit of God reigns, there will be no talk of unsuitability in the marriage relationship. We will not make this an excuse for our relationship not working properly saying we don't fit to one another. If Christ indeed is formed within the hope of glory, there will be union and love in the home. Christ abiding in the heart of the wife will be at agreement with Christ abiding in the heart of the husband. They will speak the same love language because Christ is here Christ is there, and Christ with Christ cannot be other than united. <coughs> Husbands should study the pattern. You know, when husbands...
face some problems at home, they start sometimes studying the nature of the woman. They start reading books about the differences between men and women, about the way they think and feel differently, so that they should kind of make some sense of what's going on. But that will not help them too much. Instead of that, they should study something different. Here it says that husbands should study the pattern and seek to know what is meant by the symbol presented in Ephesians, the relationship Christ sustains to the church. The husband is to be as a savior in his family. Will he not as assiduously cultivate the love of Jesus, making it an abiding principle in his home, as he will assert his claims to authority, study the way Jesus loved the church? How did Jesus love the church? Conditionally or unconditionally? The Bible says, as we were still enemies, he died for us. Not because of our worth, not because of what we were like, but rather in spite of that. He loved us and he died for us in spite of our unworthiness. And we should study the pattern. And the more we study it, the more lenient we will become towards the people we have to deal with. If they have shortcomings, if they commit mistakes, we can understand that because we used to do that before and Christ had a long patience towards us. So husbands should study the pattern and not only study it, but imitate it. He is to be as a savior in his family. And when we talk about a savior, we think of sacrifice. And the dimension of the love is expressed in this Bible verse saying, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. This gives the dimension, the love we are supposed to manifest towards our spouses, even as Christ loved the church. Considering this love, beholding it, contemplating it, we are changed into the same image from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. This solves marital problems. This brings us closer to the purpose which God has always had with the family institution. And it will make us experience that genuine joy and happiness of togetherness. All who are under the training of God need the quiet hour for communication with their own hearts, with nature, and with God. If we take this quiet hour for communion with God, for introspection, to try and understand ourselves, to try and understand the circumstances in our lives, to try and understand our relationships, then our re reaction will change. They need to have a personal experience in obtaining a knowledge of the will of God. We must individually hear him speaking to the heart when every other voice is hushed. And in quietness, we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. But some might say we are too busy for that. 
We live in this challenging world and there's no time. Who can afford one hour? That's 60 minutes just doing nothing. But if we do not take this time, this will have such an impact, such a damaging impact upon our lives that nothing else we can achieve in life will be able to compensate for. He bids us, be still and know that I am God. And he who is thus refreshed will be surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace. Have you ever tried to argue with a person surrounded with an atmosphere of light and peace? You will never manage to have an argument with such a person because it will not work. What about the wives? It says the adorning should not be the outward adorning of plating the hair, of wearing of gold, of putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. I like the way the Bible expresses this idea because we do not have the word character in the Bible as such. But they found a way of expressing the notion of character by calling it the hidden man of the heart. That which is not corruptible, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Cherish this one. Take time to adorn your soul, to improve your character under the guidance and the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust in God after this manner and being in subjection. When we have this experience, subjection to one another will no longer be a problem. It, of course, we do it because we love it. We love the partner. Actually, true love suffers long, is kind, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and this kind of love shall never perish. Now what is the connection between the quality of our family relationship and our eternal destiny? Here we read that unless you manifest meekness, kindness, and courtesy in your home, your religion will be vain. You cannot have a disastrous life at home and still be a great Christian. We might experience problems, but the pro we should not be the source of these problems. We should manifest meekness, kindness, and courtesy. Can we do that? Without Christ, never. With Christ, we can always do it. And unless we do it, our religion will be in vain. In God's sight, a man is just what he is in his family. So when God considers us, he will consider our family relationship. Not the way we sing, not the way we preach, not the way we pray, not the way we give lectures or say poems, but the way we behave at home. In God's sight, a man is just what he is in his family. And Abraham was called the friend of God because he cultivated home religion. The fear of God pervaded his household. He was the priest of his home. He was looked upon his family as a sacred trust. By the combined influence of love and justice, he ruled his household 
in the fear of God, and the Lord bore witness to his faithfulness. Now, if we would enjoy eternal bliss, we must cultivate religion in the home. And what's the starting point of it? How can we begin cultivating religion at home? By first cultivating our personal relationship with Christ. And we've just read, if Christ is in our hearts, this will impact our f family life. That which will make the character lovely in the home is the same thing that will make it lovely in the heavenly mansions. So there needs to be a continuity. The way we are at home needs to be heaven on earth. And the servant of the Lord wrote the following, I am instructed to urge upon our people most earnestly the necessity of religion in the home. Among the members of the household, there is ever to be a kind, thoughtful consideration. At the season of evening worship, let every member of the family search well his own heart. Let every wrong that he has been committed be made right. Often grievances are cherished in the mind and misunderstandings and heartaches are created that need not be if the one who is suspected of wrong will be given an opportunity he might be able to make explanations that would bring relief to the other members of the family. Satan is ever ready to take an advantage trying to cause alienation between the spouses. Will we allow him to do that? No, we shall not. So let us avoid any kind of alienation. And it says, if the law of God is obeyed, the demon of strife will be kept out of the family. No separation of interests will take place. No alienation of affection will be permitted. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. And actually, we do not argue about real things. When we argue, we argue because of this one single reason. The cause of division and discord in families and in the church is separation from Christ. To come near to Christ is to come near to one another. The secret of true unity in the church and in the family is not diplomacy, not management, not a superhuman effort to overcome difficulties, though there will be much of this to do, but union with Christ. So the secret of true unity is union with Christ. Coming closer to Christ means we come closer to one another. Let a spirit of controversy cease at home and in the church. Hearts that are filled with the love of Christ can never get very far apart because religion is love. We can never see the kingdom of heaven unless we have the mind and the spirit of Christ. Then copy the pattern at home, at your work, and in the church, while doing all you can on your part to perfect Christian character, give your heart to God for him to mold according to his pleasure. He will help you. I know he will. May God bless you and your dear children. And may I meet you all around the great white throne. 
is my prayer. Amen.